This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. I've been a big fan of Peter Ginn ever since I watched the first episode of Victorian Farm, where he portrayed a Victorian-era farmer in England alongside Ruth Goodman and Alex Langlands. Peter has definitely combined his knowledge of the past with entertainment and is a proud ambassador for preserving historic trades and crafts. In short, he's the ideal PreserveCast guest. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast, and today we're thrilled to be joined by a friend from across the pond, Peter Ginn, an archaeologist uh, who not only has a background in true archaeology, but also uh, has done some amazing work with the BBC and uh, a series of different shows really looking and diving into uh, experiential uh, and experimental archaeology. Um, but before we get into all of that, we love to get to know our guests, um, particularly those coming to us from you know, halfway around the world. So, Peter, like, where did you grow up? And I suppose, what, when did you get this history bug? Because obviously, you have a real passion for this, and we're going to talk all about that and a book that you've written and the work that you've done on television. But where did this all start? Where's the passion begin? Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I mean, in terms of growing up, I grew up all over. My father was in the, the British Army, so we moved around. Uh, in fact, the house I'm living in at the moment, uh, which is in the west of England, in Somerset, I've been here for just over six years. And that's the longest I've stayed in a house in my life, which is quite crazy. And he dawned on me the other day. So we, we went all around Europe. And of course, Europe is entirely dotted with history, shall we say. There's, there's, there's castles, there's, uh, there's bridges, there's cities, there's lots of different people. It's like a melting pot. And I think probably through a series of just my parents pulling me around to various museums and things, I did take an interest. I took an interest. It's, it's partly in the history, but it's more in the sort of process and how things are made on material culture and the insight that gives into the individual and the community that created it. So you go from a passion to, do you just decide you're going to go and get a degree in archaeology? Did you, were there fits and starts or was it always like, I'm going to do this and dad was okay with you not, not joining the military? <laughs> <laughs> my, my father was, he was fine with me not joining the military. I think uh, he was, he joined um, at a very young age. He joined at 15. Uh, to, oh my to gosh. Escape, to 15? Escape, yeah. 15. Is that, yeah. is that, a, uh, is that he, normal? uh it's it was then uh now you you have to be 16 now i think um 16 okay wow yeah which is which is quite crazy um but it's, got, it's called boys service and then obviously when you when you turn 18 then it, it's it's a uh, full-blown service okay but he um yeah he, he he joined at 15 uh he was in for just over 30 years and probably by the time he left he'd, he'd had enough of it he said he never wanted anyone to tell him, you know, how, how he should wear his shirt or, or what he should be doing. But no, in terms of, in terms of the archaeology and the history, it, it, I, was, I was kind of at a loss at school because I was, I was caught between the arts and the sciences. And in the UK, we have to do something called work experience. So basically, while you're at school, you spend a week effectively working in a job to uh, to get an idea of what the workplace might be like and also what you might like to do. So the first thing I asked to do, because you, you can get to request whatever you want, I said I, I quite fancied being a lawyer, like a barrister, because I'd seen something called Rumble of the Bailey, which is a very quaint English program of this barrister that bumbles along, sort of looking after the criminal classes. And, uh, and my school managed to get me a work placement at a debt collector's. Um, which was very odd and not kind of what I'd, I'd hoped for. So the next time we had to do work experience, I organised it myself and I ended up working for the Oxford Archaeological Unit. And I'd get a train every morning, go down to Oxford, and, um, and we would just go and dig on sites. And I, I didn't really – I had an idea of archaeology, um, but it, it, do it, actually experiencing it, and, and seeing that work environment, I, I, I fell in love with it. And then when it came time to choose a degree, 
I, I was toying between, I was potentially going to go and do English literature or I was going to read um, aeronautical engineering. I almost went to Imperial to, to do aeronautical engineering. And on a whim, I decided to do archaeology. I so actually you did a... I was just gonna say, like, you really are like you. You've, it, it, you're, you're you're sort of this renaissance. I mean, everything from aeronautical archaeology to uh, a bumbling barrister to a <laughs> a debt collecting barrister, to, yeah. <laughs> which is probably why you decided not to go that route. I think that would be the most the most depressing Indeed, yeah. of the uh, <laughs> of the of the legal opportunities. Um, so then you 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 kind of get this archaeology bug. You end up in Oxford doing this work. How do you jump from, I mean, I think this is the fascinating thing. So for people here in the U.S. who haven't yet watched some of these series that you've been involved in, and, and I would implore them to do it, it's just not only is it is it really just fascinating and really kind of gives you a glimpse of British and, and really world history, but um, it's just good entertainment. And they're all available now pretty much on um, Amazon, so Americans can pick them up here now and you can stream them. Um so, you know, everything from Edwardian farm to Victorian, um, you know, um, tales from the, the monastery, all these things. So, but how do you go from sort of this traditional academic digging, ar- excavation, archaeology to I'm going to be sort of a quasi BBC heritage star? Because that's like, that's the jump that I think is so interesting. How did that all come about? Well, there was a the television uh, production company that made them is Lion TV. They're based in uh, uh, in London, and, and they've got an office in New York as well. And they came up with well, they I say they came up with they had been working with a chap on a, a series called Tower, which was looking at the Tower of London, and he was a uh, a reenactor. So he reenacted uh, sort of the Civil War and um, and Tudor history. And he proposed doing a series on a hill farm that he was renovating in Wales. So they put out these adverts looking for weatherproof historians. Uh, And they went to lots of different places and uh, where I was working, the archaeological unit, and also I was still involved with UCL at that point. Um, I I saw these adverts and everyone said, oh, you should go for that. And I I was like, no, that's, that's not really my thing. But a, a good friend of mine, Alex Langlands, who is uh, my co-presenter, he he saw them and he he went for the interview and he got the job, and um, he he ended up on this hill farm and it was it was interesting. And while I was there, basically they said to me, "Would you stay? You know, you, you guys work really well together. Uh, it's a nice foil uh, for." We had a presenter called Chloe Spencer, who we also knew from university. Um, and Ruth was there. That's when we first met Ruth, who was actually the age I am now. And uh, and it was a very odd series. It, it was called Tales from the Green Valley. At the time, there was this kind of culture in the UK of uh, reality TV was very much psychodramas. I, I'm not sure if it's a term you've come across, but it's it was it, it, it wasn't the kind of scripted reality that reality TV has morphed into. Right. It was it was kind of taking everyday folks, putting them in a situation, and then just watching them break. Sort of like here, and I don't know if you have a version of it there or if it shows there, but like Survivor was one of the original ones yeah. here in the US. Yeah. yeah, no, indeed. Survivor, very much so. And uh, there was an element of that to the program initially, I think, in the sort of mock-up. And they uh, they hadn't they got their third chap the third director a guy called Peter Summer who now runs a, a tour company in Turkey he came along he was also from UCL it's a very small world he had given up on his PhD in history for his TV career and when he was there he he made the decision he didn't want to see if we could survive the situation he wanted to see if we could explore the history. So this this program very much took that direction, but it was it was literally uh, it was the five of us. We were living on this this little hill farm, or or nearby anyway, uh, because we were also doing it up. And Peter moved out there, and we had very little contact with any production company. There were no sort of runners or researchers or anything like that. 
Uh, we did have a, a cameraman and sound man that came for two days a month and and filmed. And Pete would film on a handheld uh, video camera for a, an extra day. And, and that was us. And uh, I think it was referred to at the time, I think, as the funny farm by Lion. It was, it was one of these things that they just didn't know what was going on. All they knew was there was these crazy people hanging out in a what was called Grey Hill. It was very, very wet and cold. And, uh, and we produced, actually, it was quite beautiful TV, to be honest. And the public reception in the UK? It, it, was, it went down remarkably well. I don't think the BBC really knew what to do with it because, again, it was it was completely – it didn't fit anything that had gone before. And it was 12 episodes long, only half-hour episodes. And they finally put it out, and it pulled down, well, very, very good viewing figures um, at the time, which is – I think it was only – it was about 1.6 million, which doesn't sound like much, but for its time slot and where it was, it did very, very well. And that kind of lit the fire under getting uh, Victorian Farm eventually commissioned. And then Victorian Farm is is fantastic. I mean, it's a, these are just really compelling shows. Now you're not so talk, talk about like the psychodrama kind of thing where you're like putting people into it and expecting them to live that way. You didn't. You weren't having to live as a Victorian farmer the entire time. I presume that you would go off site and kind of just live a normal life or what was the what was the experience like it's it's a hybrid because you you can't there's no production company in the world that would be able to facilitate you living as a victorian because you can't you can't set up that culture you can't go down to the the victorian shops and you you don't have uh, the craftspeople that would have been around in abundance you don't have indeed the people to work on the land however everything you see on screen is as real as we can make it. And uh, myself and Alex lived there full time um, and ran the farm. And Ruth, she had a, a young family at the time, so she, she would come in for filming. Um, but we, we were as close as we could be to being Victorian farmers. And, you know, we, we, we constantly used the tools and, uh, and uh, we, worked, we worked the farm. And in between filming weeks, you, we filmed one week a month uh, the other three weeks we were there getting the projects done, basically. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, of all the series that you did, and they're all really compelling. I mean, obviously I'm gushing about these, but I think people should should go and watch them. I mean, it's just really interesting television. And, and I think that there's something really powerful for people who work in preservation and history to think about how you appropriately kind of turn heritage into entertainment, how you reach the masses and teach important stories, but make it fun. Like it's, it's compelling. It's interesting. There's funny parts to it. And, um, but of all the series that you worked on, did you have a favorite? Oh, it's really hard to say, cause they are so different. I would have to say, I'd probably pick two to be honest. Tales from Green Valley for its purity. I really liked. And that, that was just fantastic. However, I think Victorian Farm, especially Victorian Farm Christmas specials, is kind of where we hit our zenith. You know, we did three episodes, which is it's half the, the, the running time of the whole of Victorian Farm. And we did it on bricks, you know, <laughs> taking you know, the brick and, and ma- managing to get three hours of TV out of it was, was quite good. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, that, was fun. that was fun TV to watch. So um, let me ask you this. I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with American history. I imagine as a, as a historian and archeologist, you're somewhat familiar with uh, life over here a little bit, or at least some of our history. But if you could, and I asked Ruth this question too, but if you could recreate a period and I say, Ruth, we had Ruth Goodman on in a previous episode. Um, but if you could recreate a period or come over here and do a period of American history, would you have one that you would want? And you'd say, Oh, I got to do that period in America. When I was at university, at the end of my first year, we, we, ha- we had to go and dig for 70 days. I and mean, you could break that up however you wanted. And the university covered uh, things like flights and um, accommodation, which was, was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I ended up in Lubbock, Texas, uh, which hmm. was very, very interesting. A place called the uh, Lubbock Lake Landmark, uh, doing a dig there. And that, that whole project looks at two elements. Um, 
it looks at it's trying to find the store the general store from the uh, 1880s and it also has a um, a paleolithic bison kill site so it's two very very different types of history and it just emphasizes how how rich uh, a, a kind of cultural heritage the united states has but many many years ago probably about 15 years ago i read a book called the interpretation of murder it's guy, by a guy i think called um jed rubenfeld and it's 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 sigmund freud's visit to the united states in 1909 and it's a fictionalized version of the events that went on it's effectively him solving a murder um and a lot of it focuses on the building of the manhattan bridge in the east river and these cassians that they put in into the river and pump the water out in order to uh, to construct the bridge and my mother um she was born in glasgow but she ended up living and working for a number of years in new york and i i think i would love to have I'd love to be able to see a city such as that be created. Because um, one of the series we did uh, was in France in a place called Guédelon. And um, in Guédelon, they're, they're effectively building a medieval castle from scratch. And where tool meets stone, everything is historically accurate. And what they found is that the castle is almost it's almost secondary to the process because it's the building of the castle has created a community and it, it's created, um, it, it, it's created this whole, you know, the, the blacksmiths and the stonemasons and the carpenters and how they all interact and the carters as they take, um, as they take uh, tools or stone around the sites, they also take messages. There's obviously there's no phones or things like that. And it, it, it just it, it just must be amazing to see it, it, it's the people behind the building, should we say? Yeah, and I think that that's 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 what comes through a lot in the series too. Is that it's very much about the people who lived these lives and and what it was like. It's not just sort of a, a dry recitation of history, which is I think I think why how it really kind of comes alive. So let, this might be a good place to kind of switch here, where you're talking about craft and tools and skills and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, if people are interested in watching you, they can pick you up, you know, here in the United States on, I know Amazon Prime streams these series. So in addition to your work on the BBC, you're also a published author. Um, and you, people, you know, obviously, in addition to watching these series can pick up this new book, um, which was just released back in 2019, Slow Tech, The Perfect Antidote to Today's Digital World. Um, and we have a link to where you can buy that um, in the show notes here. Um, so, uh, what prompted this? Uh, you cover a lot of, a lot of ground in the book. Um, what was the, what was the interest in doing this? It, it all began with, um, uh, I was asked by Haynes, by, uh, by the editor of Slow Tech, uh, Joanne Rippon. She was working on a project called The Medieval Castle, which was effectively a book on Gedlon, which was the, the castle we had worked on in France. And she asked me to do a forward. And I said, of course, yeah, that'd be fantastic. And she said, you know, if you have any ideas uh, for a project you'd like to do, you know, please get in touch. So I, for a long time, I toyed with this whole idea of experimental archaeology. And I actually, I, I initially pitched in an idea of surviving like a, a big world event, a bit, a bit like a nuclear war. Uh, the reason being is as a child, with my father being in the army and with it very much being the Cold War, a lot of my weekends were spent, sat in a barrack somewhere with a little tag on me, uh, sort of d d saying my status of where I was in the war. So if I'd been killed or if I was being evacuated or whatever, because they were constantly wargaming out what was going to happen. Um, it's a fun thing to do with a child. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, well, everyone, everyone had to get involved, you know. Everybody the plays army, their part. <laughs> yeah, it sucks you all in. But... um she found it a bit macabre, but she quite liked the idea of just switching off from the digital world and getting back to back to nature and back to the, the processes. Um, and so I found myself with Joanne and uh, a brilliant photographer called Jake Easton in my garden, 
just doing these projects. I mean, Joanne, she really was a driving force. She's very, um, very analytical as an editor. She did one of these books. Uh, Haynes are very they're famous for car books, you know, how, how you fix your car. That's how they started. And she was doing one on the, uh, the Millennium Falcon. And she was just trying to, she wants all the details to be correct. And she just kept asking the question, what fuel does the Millennium Falcon use? What, how does it power itself? How does it run? And she just couldn't get an answer. And in the end, she ended up talking to George Lucas directly. And he, he said, well, I just don't know. So he decided that it would be Riponium. And he named it after her. So now the Millennium Falcon runs on Riponium. So I, I had her in my garden sort of getting myself and Jake to, you know, get a wriggle on and, and get these things done. And then we produced what's hopefully quite a, quite a beautiful book. It is. It really is a beautiful book. And it, it really is. It's approachable. I mean, you, you read it. I mean, I read it and I'm, you know, I'm like, hey, I could try some of these things out. This is this is pretty cool. I mean, it really is sort of approachable. I think you cover a lot of ground. So you go from like wooden spoons to tanning rabbit pelts. I feel like that was the one that I was like, I don't know if I can do this. That, that <laughs> seems, I, don't, it's, I don't know. But um, if you were going to encourage somebody picking up the book, they're going to buy this because they're interested in it after hearing this, um, it make a great gift, all that kind of stuff. But what would be the first project that you'd encourage like a total novice to do? I, it's, it's tricky. I suppose it comes down to what you're comfortable with, but I, I would argue that anything to do with mud, to be brutally honest, is probably a good way to start because it, it's everywhere, isn't it? You know, it's, it's effectively in the ground. Is actually quite a nice, enjoyable and quite easy project. Even if you never light a fire in it, you can just literally sculpt, you know, the oven itself. Um, but they're, they're very, uh, they're very essential to human beings and our survival, you know, our sort of daily bread, our daily grind. It, it, it really kind of, it's something we need. And uh, it, it has, you know, it's been very, very, um, yeah, very big in the cultures throughout history. So do you have a, a mud bread oven in your backyard right now? Yeah, we do. Um, I, <laughs> I didn't know the answer to that question <laughs> when I asked it. So you actually do. That's great. Yeah. We got, we, well, we've got the one that we built for um, for the book. Uh, I'm also going to... And it's still there. It's survived. I mean, that's obviously was several yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, still survives. Um, I've got a... It's got a little bit of a, a clay covering to it. Uh, but I also thatch it slightly. So I just put a, a few sort of cuttings of course you did. on it. And it's just, a little, just a little thatching. You know, no big yeah. deal. Well, not, not, you know, not, not <laughs> sort of intricate thatching, but, you know, just stick some cuttings up there and it just sheds the rain. Uh, but yeah. no, I, I want... I want to try and build a pizza oven for the boys this year um, and maybe get the boys to help too are they oh, into yeah, this 100 def- percent. yeah they were there they are currently seven and four so okay very much so yeah. now you didn't follow in your father's military footsteps any chance they follow in the archaeology footsteps too too early well, to say too early to say i'd say but uh maybe i think my oldest son is he's very much into his art at the moment so he's He's enjoying painting and things like that. Yeah. Good good skill for uh, for these times. Well, why don't we take a quick break right here? And then when we come back, let's talk about your home that you're rehabbing, um, future of historic trades, and, and we'll do that when we return here on PreserveCast. This episode of PreserveCast is brought to you by Tolson's Chapel and School, a national historic landmark in Sharpsburg, Maryland. Built in 1866 by free and newly freed African-Americans, the Methodist Chapel doubled as a Freedmen's Bureau school from 1868 to 1869, and the county-run Sharpsburg Colored School until 1899. To learn more about this fascinating story and unique heritage, please visit Tolson's Chapel at tolsonschapel.org. That's T-O-L-S-O-N-S-C-H-A-P-E-L dot O-R-G. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast today. We're thrilled to be joined by a good friend from across the pond, Peter Ginn, who is an archaeologist. Uh, we've been talking about um, his work on the BBC, as well as his new book, Slow Tech, The Perfect Antidote to Today's Digital World, which you can pick up um, via the link in the show notes. Uh, we would encourage you to do that. It's a fantastic read. And before we took our break, we were talking about 
um, you know, get involved with mud, uh, make a, a bread oven, do something with your hands in the backyard. Um, perfect opportunity during uh, some of these downtimes and lockdowns. So your bio mentions you're restoring a home of your own. Um, what's the project like? Are you doing the work yourself? What's the what's the home like? So it, it was Joanne who wrote that bio, and I mean our, our our house will forever be a work in progress. I think um, so. We, my wife and I, were living uh, in London, in central London, just by Kings Cross Station, which uh, is famous for a number of things, but most recently it's. It's where Harry Potter gets the train to Hogwarts. And then uh, we were expecting our first child. And, um, at, at that time, the month before he was born, my wife developed a lump. And then just after he was born, it got biopsied and it turned out to be cancer. So um, luckily, we, we got it all, all treated, um, had the chemo, had the radiotherapy. But what became apparent was we weren't going to return to the life we had before. Uh, she she wanted a change, so we um, we left London and we came to the West Country, and we were very very lucky to find a house built by the same architect who built um, St Pancras, which is a station next to Kings Cross. So it's a sort of Gothic revival, Victorian Gothic, and um, nobody wanted it, so it was exceedingly cheap. And the people we bought it from, uh, they had bought it just after the Second World War. Um, So the RAF had had it. Then they took it on. And then they were in their 90s, I think. And they just, they they were leaving. And they wanted the family to go in there. So here we are. And it needs, it's it's livable. We're living here. But it also will need a lot of work over time. I mean, our our water comes out of a a spring. Um, You know, we're, we're, we we rely on our fire very much for heating um and the stonework needs to be done the windows need to be done the roof needs to be done but we're doing as much as possible ourselves so my it sounds like it would make a good it'd make a good bbc series i i think it could do um, you know and they, although, maybe they could pay for the rehab too <laughs> yeah <laughs> they, well that, they always plead poverty and uh <laughs> <laughs> Probably rightly so. I mean, that's that's the great thing about the BBC. It is it is public money, so you have to always always be mindful of uh, where it's spent. I suppose. But yeah, it's um it's it's a fantastic project. And and are you a doing one. a lot of the work yourself, trying to do the work with your oh, own hands, completely. or yeah, yeah completely. Very, very much. And so. I, I mean, we, we we I I will always get you know get help when I need help, but right. as much as much as possible, doing the work ourselves. And uh, just so because you brought her up, I was going to say, is your is your wife as into this? I mean, obviously, she went along for the ride with the uh, historic home. So, uh, is, does she work with her hands and build bread ovens and restore stone and thatch? Yeah, very much. So. She she has been tackling the garden. To be honest, she's been okay. um, because it, it because obviously the, the chaps who lived here as they got older, the garden got overgrown. So that she's been kind of rescuing the features. Um, she's out there right now, probably with a. She's, she's, uh, I'm, I'm more of a hands tool person, you know, using kind of bill hooks and things like that. Whereas my wife is, she quite enjoys the chainsaw. You know? <laughs> <So> <laughs> she's out there chopping everything up. <laughs> That's great. So, um, you know, um, and this is a good place maybe to, to talk about this because we're, we're talking about restoring things and using our hands and the trades and all that sort of thing. So a lot of the BBC series that you were featured in, you spend a lot of time discussing the challenge of historic trades and sort of these lost trades. I mean, some of them are like really kind of niche, you know, like... Um, I think it's in the Edwardian one where you're talking about, you know, making like crab traps by hand and things like that. I mean, that is clearly a lost trade. But then there's, you know, stonemasonry and there's blacksmithing and all that sort of thing. Based on what you've seen, based on what's going on in the UK, are you optimistic about the future of trades? What is, is that something that worries you? What do you what do you think about trades having been so involved in this and then kind of written a book that touches on trades and crafts and handicrafts? Yeah, it's I think we're living in a, I mean, we're living in a very interesting age. The internet has, um, it's done a lot of things and we're only just now getting to grips with exactly what the impact of the internet is. Uh, and some of that is obviously uh, mental health issues um, with uh, sort of being addicted to um, 
kind of social media likes and things like that. But on the other hand, there's this huge information sharing platform. And I think you can, you can find out pretty much anything uh, using the internet, especially things like YouTube, uh, a number of videos. Suddenly you can, you can delve into some very interesting crafts and trades. So I think that the, the, the crafts and the trades are having a, a bit of a renaissance. Uh, I think the, the knowledge is now becoming preserved because anyone can film what they're doing. Anyone can publish that and it will be there pretty much forever. And, it, you know, it's, it, 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 I've always cited concrete as an example in terms of the Romans were masters of concrete. Um, and they, they built many, many buildings using concrete and they knew exactly what they were doing and they could use it underwater. And then we, we lost that knowledge with the fall of the Roman Empire. And it was only um, sort of the latter part of the 19th century, going into the 20th century, that we were really regaining our knowledge of concrete. It was very, very much actually the, the Germans who were great allies of Britain up until 1914. Uh, that that had sort of recaptured that. Uh, it's because um, I, I, there's a there's a site uh, down by um, in Wiltshire, very close to Stonehenge, where all the um, uh, all the training camps were for the, the the people that were going out to fight in the First World War, and there's very sort of rudimentary concrete footings of um, uh, observation balloons, so that. They could go up and, and watch these sort of mock battles before they all got shipped off to the, the Western Front. And so much of that had actually come from Germany. You know, without, without that German knowledge, we may well not have done so well, should we say, not that you can do well it, it, during the First World War, which is quite interesting. But anyway, I mean, it, it's, very, it's very easy to lose knowledge. It's a bit like I think NASA have... Uh, a number of uh, tapes or, 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 uh, or um, information formats that they can't access because they've lost the machines that play them. And they don't want to sort of, you know, they don't want to kind of try and reverse engineer it because they might lose it. It's, um, so it, it can happen to anything. But I, I do think we are, we are in a in an age of of information sharing, and I think an awful lot of people are taking a, a lot more of an interest in those processes, especially as they become sort of more aware of kind of environment and our impact. And and it, you know, it, one of the projects I did in in Slow Tech was was weaving. Um, and there's a there's a great video on YouTube of a it's a Swiss is it Swiss no. Nor- Norwegian we- weavers on a little island in Norway and it's been an uninterrupted process for hundreds of years and this is from the I think the 1950s and it was just amazing to watch and when I did the weaving it's remarkable how hard it is actually to weave clothes I mean the setup's hard and it, it just takes a long time it's very addictive but it does give you an appreciation of just how hard it was to produce things like clothes or to produce anything really. It's only, it's only recently that we are able to produce things in abundance. Although my, my worry is always that there will be someone somewhere in the world that's doing the hard work, which is kind of what I've always thought. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that that, uh, you know, in terms of just how, um, and I, your book really gets at this too, and sort of the same idea, which is, you know, we in this digital world we do need sort of opportunities to work with our hands and slow down a little bit. Um, yeah. And um, I think you are right that that it is it is a, a renaissance um, and just an interest in sort of traditional things and things that take time and sort of putting effort and time into things. So um, yeah, that's good to hear. So. Um, any exciting projects on the horizon for you? Should we be looking for you in another BBC series? Are you are you filming something? Are you pitching something? You want to come over here and film something in the US? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to, to be honest. I mean, it's um, there's always projects on the go. You know, it's my, my life is uh, revolves around projects. One which was very close to actually getting commissioned um, just shortly before, obviously, all this, this uh, uh, COVID happened 
was um, uh, Egypt. We were going to be doing a, a, a farming project out in Egypt, which was, wow. would have been absolutely fantastic. So my degree in archaeology is actually in Egyptian archaeology. So, right. um, and kind of the, the Egyptian uh, cultural heritage is it's quite an interesting... Uh, it's not the the pharaonic culture has subsequently been there's been a number of cultures that come in subsequently to that so um it's it is very much a world heritage and it was lost for a very long time it was only rediscovered during that victorian period and um yeah i think it would have been absolutely fantastic to be able to go out there and really explore many of those very early farming and construction techniques so maybe a, such, maybe a post-COVID opportunity? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. I've also been asked to write a book on spoons, which is a bit, bit left field, but I think that will be quite an interesting uh, sort of look at what is a very ubiquitous uh, utensil in everyone's cupboard. But in fact, you know, it's, it's been threaded throughout human history and, and has many different forms. So... Um, that's, well, that's it should awesome. come as should come as high praise for me to say I would read the spoon book. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> so, if people want to learn more about you, uh, make sure that they can get the spoon book. Uh, find out if you know anything like that. Is there a way to follow you? Do you have a social media presence? Uh, Is it? It was actually kind of difficult to to yeah. track you down a little bit. So, I, I know it's it's true. I need. I probably do need a social media presence. Um. I the reason why I don't have one is because I was actually a very early adopter of Twitter, but at the time the BBC was very anti-social media uh, because they really? were very they were worried. This is two thousand nine. They were worried about the programs being kind of spoiler alert. You know, it's, it's kind of the the secrets of any program being released before the program was. Um, so they, I, I was actually told if I wanted to do Wardian Farm, I needed to not have a Twitter account. So I, I went, I went the other way, and and then it, then it kind of everyone was doing it, and uh, and I, I never got, I, I, I missed out on the Facebook thing. But I, I would say if anyone had any questions, if you were happy, you know, they could send them to you, and you forward them on, and I will, I will answer anyone's questions or we will, anything like that we would be we would be pleased to do that so we'll do that so um this is like an impossible question for pretty much anybody who comes on the show but we ask it just to make people squirm what is your favorite historic place or site yeah i i, I it that is a very very hard question to answer i mean it's it, they're so varied aren't they um and i mean i've i've always loved i mean place like venice for example which is entirely a, a world heritage site and the buildings there are absolutely fantastic um as is the fact that there are no cars on on the island of venice itself however i mean very close to where we are um there's a there's a quarry uh, it's called ham hill so the, the house that we're in at the moment the house i'm living in at the moment has been built out of hamstone as have all the buildings around here and that that quarry is also an iron age hill fort and um it has been in operation continuously since the Roman period. So just over 2,000 years, it's been constantly producing stone, um, only small quantities. And we went up there uh, on the very first day of um, uh, this year, uh, January the 1st, uh, to see the sunrise. And there was no one else there. And it was just absolutely amazing. Uh, it was a frost on the ground and the sun came up. And I think... That's probably what I like the most in terms of historical places. You know, those, those sort of places in the landscape, even, even something as simple as a farmer's field where every single year, regardless of what, what's going on in terms of the politics or the economics, someone has gone into that field, they put a plough in the ground, they ploughed it up and they've planted a crop and they've, they've fed a nation. and it just has this unbroken history. And uh, I, I think that's that's something to be admired. It reminds well, that, us how 
So yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that, I was just going to say that's a that's a fantastic answer and a fantastic way to end this. I, I I see how you got a career on the BBC, being able to kind of just go off the cuff on this stuff, and you know that that layer of history is is so fascinating, and and I think from you know a younger nation, at least in terms of you know European settlement, we have a long history of you know prehistoric settlement, but. Um, to think about something that's been actively mined for 2000 years is just phenomenal. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, I can see why you'd want to go up there and, and see the sunrise and kind of commune with that, that long period of history. You know, we too are a part of history. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, this has been just fantastic. So interesting to talk with you. Um, and thrilled to hear, um, about potentially more series uh, in the future, more books, We'll have to have you back to talk about Egypt and spoons and Egyptian spoons for that matter. Uh, uh, and uh, just thank you so much. Uh, be well. And uh, thanks for joining us on PreserveCast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. PreserveCast would like to thank McDo Preservation LLC for sponsoring today's episode. McDo specializes in program development and evaluation, long-range planning, and capacity building for nonprofit and government clients. To learn more about McDo's data and community-driven approach and commitment to equity, visit mcdo.com. That's M-C-D-O-U-X dot com. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation, and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening, and keep on preserving.